Well, one thing, you know, Amos is a very interesting book. I've always said that, uh, you know, I really like the uh, prophets, but sometimes the prophets uh, scare me. And the reason they do is because I see today the same things that are happening, that were happening then, for which they were condemned and were eventually uh, destroyed. And I think God's the same, you know, the same then as he is now, or the same now as he was, was then, even though he's been long-suffering. How long-suffering? <laughs> and I think you'll find a lot of similarities between uh, what's being talked about in Amos with what's going on today. Well, there are there any dominant themes in uh, Amos? Well, we can certainly say that uh, doom, the certainty of doom, was one of the dominant themes. And he never got far away from that. Which means that there is a reality to the judgment of God. It is as much a reality now as it was then. But also we might uh, think about in Amos 5th chapter verse 24 let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an overflowing stream now the juxtaposition of these two uh, images justice rolling down like waters and then righteousness like an uh, overflowing stream that tells me that these are connected. You can't have righteousness without justice. And if you have justice, you must have righteousness. One does not exist without the other. So that, that's a, one of the themes of uh, Amos. Now let's think about uh, justice and righteousness. If you have justice, what must you have as a corollary to justice? What must you have? You must have judgment. Now the judgment may be that you are in favor with God. That may be a, that's a judgment. But it also may be that there's a requisite punishment because justice, and especially God's justice, cannot be ignored and it cannot be denied. Now, I, I think it's it maybe interesting to, you know, of course we described Amos uh, last week, what he was like. <clears throat> he seemed to be a very educated man, but he still was a kind of a rough cut character. So, and he's very blunt to the point. He didn't care about feelings. Did he think the, that there was hope for Israel? Well, he certainly uh, offered it to Israel. But the fact that he dwelt upon doom for such an extensive portion of the uh, book almost seems to say that he didn't really think they would, they'd repent anyway. So you probably saw that the only uh, answer to Israel's problems resided in a very small remnant, and that's exactly what happened. If a remnant was going to be kept alive, there had to be a new sense of righteousness on the part of the people. And it had to be deeply ingrained into the hearts and minds of these people. And of course, uh, one of the problems of Israel was idolatry. And after the exile, you know, the few that came back, that wasn't a problem anymore. They had other problems, but that was not a, not a problem. <clears throat> 
where there's some other aspects uh, to his teaching that we may not be the dominant theme, but there certainly is one of the major themes. One of the uh, major themes that is brought out in the book of uh, Amos is that uh, the, the sovereignty of God, he is supreme. Amos saw God is in control of the world. Not only the nation of Israel and Judah, for that matter, but every other nation. Not just the God of Israel, but of the whole world. And that's why he could render judgment on those uh, non-chosen people, if you want to call that. Uh, he could render judgment to them also. Amos view, viewed God as uh, dealing out uh, punishment in accordance with his standard of righteousness. And it didn't matter who it applied to. God has a standard of righteousness. The nations were to be punished impartially in relation to God's standard. He never sets aside his standards. God demanded righteousness. He ruled in righteousness. And he judged in righteousness. And that's the foundation on what uh, you know, all these other teachings and Amos are built around. Another aspect of uh, Amos' teaching is a relationship between privilege and responsibility where there's great privilege there's great responsibility for Amos God uh, greatness of God uh, presented a challenge to righteous living and the duty that's associated with that righteousness it was a heavy responsibility. Israel was subject to that responsibility, but they, they failed in that uh, aspect of it. Now, because Israel was a chosen people, now they, the people of Israel took that extreme, and we'll cover that later. It meant something different to them than what it really was, but since they were a chosen people, they were held to a higher degree of responsibility. They viewed themselves, you know, they, this particular time was a very prosperous, uh, prosperous uh, period for Israel. And you know what happens when you get to be very prosperous. You, you think you're the ones that did it. And you think that God is favoring you in some special way because of your prosperity and that you're allowed to do things that those other people are not allowed to do. I must say that Buddy has never exhibited those tendencies. <laughs> He's still just as humble as always. <laughs> anyway, Amos said, dispel that thinking that the uh, people were safe and their affluence. And he called them back to the uh, basic principles of life. Being chosen of God means immeasurably more responsibility. Not distinctive privilege or special exemptions. Another uh, aspect of Amos's teaching was the uh, curse of unconcern. He was uh, constantly upset by the lack of concern on the part of God's people and the extent that they uh, went to disparage and disadvantage those who were less uh, favor less uh, prosperous than they were and they could care less about the poor just so long that they could get theirs that's all they're concerned about 
and he has a special uh, condemnation for those idle rich and those that use their um, offices to uh, fraudulently take things from the poor. So he, he was, and Ben, not a rich person himself, I think he could relate to those. He was certainly independent. He took care of himself, but he realized there were some that couldn't. And the fact that these rich people took advantage of them uh, really didn't sit well with him. Another aspect of his uh, teaching is that uh, he sets forth the true basis of religion. What is the basis of true religion? Well, these people are certainly, uh, you can put in the category of, uh, they, they engage in religious exercises. But they were, these were externals. These were not internals. They did these things and they um, recognized, Amos recognized that these sacrifices and offerings and all the religious uh, uh, going on to the people were meaningless. So, you, you know, you can't, God didn't say that one shouldn't engage in religious practices because that's what we're doing now. And it's authorized. But when it's meaningless, he will reject it. He will ignore it. And that's what, uh, that's one of the messages of Amos to these people. He was uh, aiming to set forth the this vital connection between the worship of a God, a righteous God for that matter, and the exercise of righteousness in the people themselves. There was a disconnect in Israel, and it certainly didn't sit well with uh, Amos. Well, what was the, uh, the organization of, uh, the broadly, the organization of the uh, book of Amos? Well, there's the preamble that's, uh, from verse 1 of chapter 1 to, through the 16th verse, verse of uh, chapter 2. And it was uh, a section of denunciation. In fact, uh, it's mentioned a number of times of the, the roar of the lion. It was a very um, pronounced denun denunciation of the people. From the third chapter through the 14th verse of the sixth chapter, we have set forth the charges against the people, against Israel. And there you might notice that uh, in, in the first part, it talks about punishment, punishment, punishment. This part, they are told in, in chapter 3, 4, and 5, the beginning of those chapters, hear this word. So the word was coming from God. It's something that uh, Hamas was relating to these people. And then there was a solemn warning of woe in the latter part of that, this section, first, uh, or chapter 5 and chapter 6. And like I said, uh, that probably Amos's um, thought was that the only way that Israel could be salvaged at all was through a remnant. So he closes this particular section with the messages of the of this verdict of a coming captivity, and it's to be administered by a nation raised up for that purpose. Now we know from I think it's Hosea that that nation was Assyria. At this particular time, Assyria was not very strong. <clears throat> 
but they did rise up and Israel was eventually taken into exile by Syria. And this was a devastating blow to uh, a people that thought they were the privileged ones of God, that the only way that they could worship God was, uh, of course, for them was in Bethel. That's the only place that they could actually approach God. And then when they're taken off into a heathen nation, it had to be very devastating for them. But Amos saw that the, that was the only way that you're going to salvage any remnant of this nation of Israel. Third section of the book uh, deals with the visions from the seventh chapter on to the uh, tenth verse of the ninth chapter. And there are five visions that are set forth there. And these visions emphasize the certainty of doom. The first two are drawn from uh, nature, a picture of uh, disasters as illustrative of, of uh, Israel's punishment. The third deals with uh, plumb line. Fourth is drawn from a uh, from the marketplace about the figs, summer fruit. And the fifth centers on a, uh, a religious scene, and it depicts the uh, hopelessness of escape from God's punishment. As an interlude in this section, we have the historical episode of uh, Amos' encounter with Amaziah at uh, Bethel. But the section does close with a, a ray of hope that the captivity may prove to be one of discipline rather than one of utter doom. Then the very last section, you know, I always say that these uh, prophets, even though they may uh, pronounce punishment on the people, there's always hope. So the very last section, uh, verse, verses 11 through 15 of chapter 9, there's a hope offered there for a new day. And if you think about it, uh, this, this hope, this restoration is the only logical conclusion which can complete this process of punishment. Now, is, like I say, is this message relevant to us today? I think you can see that it, that it is. He speaks, Amos speaks to our day. He speaks to the problems facing us. Amos knows God. His answers are based on God's uh, a knowledge of God and his purposes. And his answers are not theoretical solutions. They're practical conclusions as to what must come to pass as, as a result of Israel's uh, uh, unfaithfulness. And if you think about it, once you read through this, you can see that the basic problems that are encountered in, in Amos and the principles that are set forth there are the same ones that exist today. There's no difference. So even though Amos may not you know, we are, after all, living in the 21st century. We all have cell phones. They didn't have them back then. So even though Amos wasn't speaking of our age, Amos was speaking to our age. And it's a vital lesson that uh, we should know. So let's... Uh, Let's get into the uh, first chapter. <clears throat> 
Now keep in mind that Amos, he's a, he has sheep, maybe very uh, valuable wool, wool coming from the sheep. He may have been moderately well off. I don't really know. He, he seems to have been uh, traveling around. You look at the uh, the writing and the imagery that set forth here in Amos, that he seemed to be an educated man. You might say, well, the Holy Spirit was the one that uh, responsible for the the words. Well, yes, but God never um, overlooked the uh, abilities, the writing style of the person to which the uh, revelation was made. That's why you can have. That's why you, you can have what, what's called a philological uh, arguments for when a piece was written because. The author still used their writing style of the period that they lived in, so he he was uh, not a dummy by any means. So now, <clears throat> here you have a sheep herder from Tekoa, which is in Judah, going up to Israel, Bethel, most likely, and he's going to preach to the people. A message of doom. Why would they listen to him? Well, I think you can kind of uh, keep in mind that back then they didn't have uh, Game Boy. What, what do they have nowadays? Game Boys? I, I don't know what they have. YouTube. How about YouTube? Didn't have YouTube. So. How did they entertain themselves? Well, they like to listen to people. Remember uh, Paul and Mars Hill and on the Aragopagus, where he told them about the unknown God. They love to hear that stuff. So here's Amos preaching to Israel and he said the very first in verse 2 the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem the pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers and we'll run across this roaring lion uh, a number of times in the book of Amos. So keep in mind that it occurred here. So, you know, a lion roar, uh, have you ever heard a lion roar? Well, I haven't. But it can be quite loud from what I understand. So if the lion is roaring from Zion, Zion is uh, portrayed as where God resides. And so this is a message from God. It's, it's clear that this message is from God. So does uh, Amos jump right in and, and uh, proclaim the doom of Israel? No, he doesn't do that. He talks about six nations and then Judah before that. And I think there's a method to his madness, if you want to call it that. Because these are really heathen nations, even though some of them have some connection to Israel. They're really heathen nations. And Amos is condemning these nations. And then he launches out into Judah, very short section on Judah and just think you know you're, you're one of these rich uh, Israelites in Bethel listening to all this stuff and you're agreeing with it you said yeah that's right you know that's exactly right you got it 
be right on. So they agree with the things that he is saying and his condemnation of these uh, six nations and, and Judah too. He's got them agreeing with it. Then he launches out into a condemnation of Israel. And they can't object to it. They've already agreed with his condemnation of these six nations. He doesn't say that they agreed with it, but you have to understand what they think about these nations. So they're agreeing with his condemnation, and then he starts condemning them. And they can't deny the truth of it. They've already admitted the truth of these other nations, and then that God has a right to condemn these other nations, and Judah he has a right to do it. Therefore, they have to conclude that God has a right to condemn them also. Anyway, in verse 3, we have the first nation, and they all start the same way for three transgressions of Damascus or whatever nation it may be, or for four. Now, that didn't mean they had only three transgressions or four, but that just uh, means that it's, it's complete. You know, they're full of it. And he also starts with, I will not turn away its punishment. I might uh, add a little note here that punishment does not appear in the Hebrew. It really just reads, I will not turn away it. But it is clear that he's talking about punishment. So the uh, translators put in the word punishment. It says here, he'll enumerate the charge against them and then the punishment. They have <coughs> threshed Gilead with implements of iron. Now, this implements of iron is really a threshing machine. And it may have uh, pieces of iron in it. If you're familiar with a harrow, um, it's, it's sort of like that, but this is for threshing grain. But they ran over people with this uh, harrow or uh, threshing machine, and that was particularly cruel to do that. So he says, I'm going to send a fire into the house of Haziel. Now, when he, when he talks about sending a fire, he's talking about destroying them. And some, someone is going to actually destroy them. He's going to devour the palaces. He's going to break the uh, bar of Damascus. I think King James says bar of Damascus. And New King James says the gate bar. You know, these uh, sanctuary places that they had that they could run to in case of danger. They'd, they'd lock the gate and have a uh, iron bar there to prevent it being, from being opened up. But th that bar is going to be broken, which means some army is going to destroy him. Now, it says the people of Syria shall go captive to Kir. And, and this all just says that they're going to be destroyed and, and eventually Syria was destroyed. And then he says in verse 6, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, again, again the same wording, I will not turn away its punishment. And their charge was that they uh, took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. Now, we've, we dealt with Edom and Obadiah. Now, it was not uncommon for a nation that conquered another nation to take people as slaves and sell them and what have you. But there's no indication here that there's any been any uh, war or, uh, you know, 
victory over some enemy. They just took a city just to sell the slaves. So they're condemned. Again, it says in verse 7, I'll send a fire upon the wall of Gaza. It will devour its palaces. So again, there's some army, some someone that's going to destroy them. And it says down in verse 8, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish. And they did. You don't hear about Philistines anymore. Palestinians, yes. Philistines, no. They're gone. In verse 9, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Same language. Because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom. Same charge, again, of settling uh, people into, into captivity to eat them no less and they did not remember the covenant of uh, brotherhood now that you know what covenant of brotherhood that was it could have been uh, you know the uh, Tyrrhenians did help David and Solomon in the building programs and Hiram you recall the Hiram where he provided uh, uh, workers for Solomon. Maybe that's it. It could be uh, covenants they had with those around about them, and then they took them in, uh, captive. But anyway, verse 10, but I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre. Again, there's some army that's going to destroy Tyre. Now, we know from history that that army was uh, the army of Alexander the Great in the 300 some such BC. Uh, Alexander the Great built a causeway to the city of Tyre, you know, it's a port city. And they had been able to escape any sort of captivity uh, before that. But he built a causeway to the city and as soon as he started that, the citizens knew that they were doomed because he, you know, Alexander the Great was not going to leave until he had destroyed Tyre, and he did. As I say, we covered uh, Edom before, but it says again in verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Same sort of language. Because he pursued his brother with a sword, you know, we covered that in uh, Obadiah and, and uh, cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually. So he's going to send a fire upon Tema. That was the principal city of Edom. And again, this imagery of sending a fire means that some army is going to destroy uh, Edom. And in fact, it was destroyed after, you know, um, about the 100 AD, something like that. They just completely disappeared. So we'll pick it up again with uh, Ammon and then uh, Moab and then Judah. Then we get into the real meat of it, Israel.